Good morning, and welcome to the American Cathedral in Paris. Everyone here in Paris and all of you online, wherever and whenever you are, you are welcome. We are delighted also to welcome a very special guest preacher this morning, the Reverend Dr. Jeffrey John. And furthermore, in our congregation, a small group of friends of Olivia de Havilland, who are here for family and friends, who are here for the dedication of the Olivia de Havilland Theater at the American University. So welcome to all of you. Blessed be God, most holy, glorious, and undivided Trinity. Let us pray together. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you 
and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, increase in us the gifts of faith, hope, and charity, and that we may obtain what you promise, make us love what you command. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. A reading from the book of Jeremiah. Thus says the Lord, Sing aloud with gladness, O Jacob, and raise shouts for the chief of their nation. Proclaim, give praise, and say, Save, O Lord, your people, the remnant of Israel. See, I'm going to bring them from the land of the north and gather them from the farthest parts of the earth. Among them, the blind and the lame, those with child and those in labor, together a great company that shall return here. With weeping they shall come, and with consolations I will lead them back. I will let them walk by brooks of water in a straight path in which they shall not stumble. For I have become a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. The word of the Lord.
Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Jesus and his disciples came to Jericho. As he and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet. But he cried out even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, Call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he is calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, My teacher, let me see again. Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and followed him on the way. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> One of the great joys of Mark's Gospel is that Jesus is so consistently rude to his disciples, who from start to finish in Mark are portrayed as thick, cowardly, self-obsessed, faithless dolts. <laughs> Jesus calms a storm, and they gape and say, Duh, who is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? He tells them to beware the leaven of the Pharisees, meaning their hypocrisy, and they start arguing about who forgot to bring the sandwiches. He tries to teach them about humility and servant leadership, and they start arguing about which of them is the greatest and who will get the best seats in heaven. In the end, Judas betrays him, Peter denies him, and they all run away, leaving him to die alone. The later Gospels actually tone all this down a bit but in Mark, the earliest gospel, the disciples are unremittingly awful. And Jesus lets them know it. He lays into them repeatedly. Faithless generation, what's the matter with you? How can you be so stupid? How long must I put up with you? Having eyes, do you not see? However, Exactly halfway through Mark, in chapter 8, at Caesarea Philippi, for the first time, one disciple gets something right. Who do you say I am? asks Jesus. And Peter blurts out, you're the Messiah, 
the son of the blessed. Well done, says Jesus, clearly surprised. It has only taken eight chapters of stupendous healings, sublime teachings, and fantastic deeds of power, but finally one of them has got there. He's seen who Jesus is. You're the Messiah. And then, as soon as Peter gets that bit right, Jesus starts trying to teach them the second part of the truth, which is that this Messiah is not going to be another King David, not a generalissimo to kick the Roman army back to Rome. This Messiah is going to be defeated, arrested, crucified, and killed. And immediately Peter says, no, Lord, that can't happen to you. And Jesus turns on him again and delivers the biggest slap of all. Get behind me, Satan. You think as men think, not as God thinks. And then we start the second half of Mark, where Jesus tries and tries again to get them to grasp this second part of the truth, that real victory only comes through service, humility, suffering, and death. Still, halfway through, Peter has got it half right. In Mark's two-act drama of Revelation, because that's what this gospel is, the disciples' eyes are half opened to see half the truth halfway through. Now, it's no accident that straight after Peter gets it half right, we get Jesus' first healing of a blind man in Mark, the blind man of Bethsaida. Not the blind man in today's gospel, he's the second blind man. The first one, halfway through, was the blind man of Bethsaida. And do you remember what was unique about the healing of the blind man of Bethsaida? Well, it's unique because it's a healing in two stages. First, Jesus lays his hands on the man and says, can you see? And he says, oh, yeah, I can see people, but they look like trees walking about. And then Jesus lays hands on him a second time, and this time he sees plainly. The obvious point is that the half-seeing of the blind man of Bethsaida exactly parallels Peter half-seeing the truth halfway through. In Mark's two-act drama, that's the end of Act One. The two-stage physical healing symbolizes the two-stage spiritual healing of Peter and the rest of the blind, thick, awful disciples. But now, in today's Gospel, we are getting to the end of Act Two. Jesus has finished trying to teach them about humility and the way of the cross, and we are about to start the Passion and Resurrection narrative. And so now we get the healing of blind man number two, Bartimaeus. And Bartimaeus is very different from the blind man of Bethsaida. There is nothing halfway about Bartimaeus. He immediately recognizes who Jesus is, and he cries out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. When the people around him try to shut him up, he shouts out all the more, Kyrie eleison, the same words we use at Mass, Lord, have mercy, Lord, let me see. Now, if you read any decent commentary on Mark's Gospel, you will discover that this little story of Bartimaeus is jam-packed with symbolism. There are lots of ambiguities and allusions in the Greek, all of which suggest conversion and baptism. Jesus tells the man his faith has healed him. 
but actually the word for healed also means saved. When Bartimaeus is told to get up, and then when he leaps up in response, the word that's used can also mean to resurrect. When he flings off his cloak, the phrase recalls the early ritual of stripping for baptism. And so does the question, what do you want me to do for you? The word that is used for seeing again here also means enlightenment, anablepsis, which was also a synonym for baptism. And finally, we are told that Bartimaeus followed in the way. The early church was, of course, known as the way. And all through the second half of Mark, Jesus has been trying to teach the disciples they must follow in the way of the cross. So now Bartimaeus does just that. He resurrects, his eyes are fully opened, he's fully enlightened, and he, follow Jesus, he follows Jesus joyfully in the way. This is the great denouement of Mark's two-act drama of revelation. Bartimaeus is the complete, fully converted disciple. Right, let's step back a bit. What am I really telling you? I am telling you that these stories about the healings of the two blind men are not meant to be taken literally. They are not about physical healing. They are there to symbolize a different kind of healing which mattered far more to Mark, which is how Jesus heals the spiritual blindness of all of us and can save all of us from our terminal stupidity and selfishness. Now you may think that this is an infuriatingly wet liberal interpretation of this miracle. Maybe you don't like the idea of the miracles being symbolic. You would prefer a nice, literal, physical cure, please. If that's the case, fine. But you really will be missing the point. And I also have to say, frankly, that if I were a blind person, I think I would hate a church that took these stories simply literally, especially if it was the kind of church which claimed that I could be miraculously cured now, because I would know that would turn out to be a lie and rather a cruel one. But if I realize that these stories are Mark's way of saying that Jesus can heal the spiritual blindness of everyone, including me, then that's good for all of us, whether we are physically blind or not. After all, if Jesus did cure two blind men 2,000 years ago, so what? How does that help me? But if his spirit is present and powerful now to heal my blindness now spiritually and make me face the truth about God and myself and the world, or if he can break down my stupid prejudices and fears and challenge me to change my hardened heart and to live in love for him and for others, then my eyes can be opened as well. Faithless generation, says Jesus. Hard-hearted, self-centered, spiritually stupid. How long must I put up with you? Having eyes, do you not see? In the end, the truth is we are all blind beggars. Kyrie eleison. Lord, let us see.
Let us stand and proclaim our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. I ask your prayers for God's people through the, throughout the world. For Lucinda Aldin, Nathaniel and Zachary Arcanons, Mark, our bishop, Michael, our presiding bishop, Justin, Archbishop of Canterbury, for this gathering and for all ministers and people. To the Pray Reverend for the Dr. Church. Jeffrey John and the people of St. George's Church here in Paris. I ask your prayers for peace, for goodwill among nations, for the well being of all people. Pray for justice and peace. I ask your prayers for the poor, the sick, the hungry, the oppressed, and those in prison. Pray for those in any need or trouble. For all those who are grieving. I ask your prayers for all who seek God or a deeper knowledge of God. Pray that they may find and be found by God. I ask your prayers for the departed, especially Nancy Webster. Pray for those who have died. For Mike Seeley, Jim Dove. I ask your thanksgivings. Praise God for those in every generation in whom Christ has been honored. Pray that we may have grace to glorify Christ in our own days. Almighty God, to whom our needs are known before we ask, help us to ask only what accords with your will and those good things which we dare not or in our blindness cannot ask. Grant us for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor.
Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. And the peace of the Lord be always with you. Please be seated. as much fun as they used to be, so I prefer to forget them, but that was awfully nice with the swell of the organ. Thank you very much. Welcome to all of you today, and a very special welcome to our guest preacher, the Reverend Dr. Jeffrey John. He is now in Paris at St. George's Anglican Church. He's formerly the Dean of St. Albans Cathedral, and he is also, what else do we have here, Dean of Magdalen College, Oxford and canon theologian and director of training in the Diocese of Southwark. So we're very glad you're here, and we're very glad you're in Paris. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> welcome. <laughs> and a very special welcome as well to everyone who is visiting today, to any newcomers among us, or people who are just here today, as I said earlier, there's a little group of family and friends of our parishioner, Olivia de Havilland, uh, in whose memory a theater was dedicated uh, this past weekend at the American University here in Paris. We have a fair number of announcements here. Uh, a reminder, first of all, that daylight savings time ends uh, next week. So if you don't change your clock, you'll be early. There'll be coffee, but you might prefer the extra hour of sleep. Uh, on Saturday of this coming week is our Halloween party for children and families, and it's really important you make a reservation today for that. Uh, following that, uh, on Monday of next week is the 1st of November, All Saints Day, and it begins for us, or actually Sunday will begin a little in advance, a 15-day period of what we're calling celebration and mourning around the Feast of All Saints. There's information in your bulletin, including the concert next Sunday of the Brahms Requiem with our own cathedral choir uh, and our celebrations and remembrances throughout the season. Please do read carefully two things. We want you to get names in for necrology to be read on All Saints Sunday, two weeks from today. If you want names in, please get them in as soon as possible. And starting next Sunday, we'll be asking you to bring something to put on a wall of remembrance in the cloister, something that you can tape up, a picture, a poem, a letter, a drawing, whatever is important to you to remember. Uh, we also, things are going on here. Um, we're saying goodbye to our accountant, Laurence Lagan, who's been with us for seven years. Most of you don't know her because she's not here on Sundays and she's not here today. But if you have a chance to say thank you, 
It's been seven years of devoted, behind-the-scenes service. We have a wonderful new replacement in Carol LaFleche, but we do want to wish Laurence well. Uh, I call your attention again to the information about the parish-wide discernment process. There is um, information, there is an insert in your bulletin. This is really important. I hope every one of you will participate. We need to know what you're thinking. And if you've just been here for a week or you've been here for 40 years, we need your voice. So please, please sign up for one of these small groups this one short evening or afternoon. It should be fun and it's really important. Uh, today, as we did last week, uh, we're going to have offering plates here as you come up to communion. Last week I said it was tacky. I said it was tacky because I hate any indication that you have to pay to go to communion. You don't. Normally, of course, though, we would be passing the plates during the singing of the offertory anthem. We can't do that because of COVID. So if you wish to make an offering, please do so on your way up. You don't have to pay for communion. <laughs> However, everybody, absolutely everybody, is invited to communion. If you are hungry for Christ, you are invited to receive. It's God's table, not ours. Sont invités à la communion tous ceux qui ont faim de Christ. La table que nous glaçons n'est pas la nôtre, mais celle de Christ. Elle est ouverte à tous. And finally, and unhappily, I think many of you know that our dearly beloved parishioner Mike Seely died this past week. It's been a very difficult couple of weeks. Longtime and very involved parishioner Nancy Webster also died this last week, and Jim Dyke the week before that. We will be mourning them and celebrating their lives. All three gave an enormous amount to the cathedral. There will be funeral services for Mike a week from Saturday, Saturday, November 6, at 2 p.m. And I know a lot of people are coming from different places, including our former canon, Liz Hendrick, um, and many will gather to remember Mike. I hope you will, too. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God.
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. God of all power, ruler of the universe, you are worthy of glory and praise. At your command, all things came to be. The vast expanse of interstellar space, galaxies, suns, the planets in their courses, and this fragile Earth, our island home. From the primal elements, you brought forth the human race and blessed us with memory, reason, and skill. You made us the rulers of creation, but we turned against you and betrayed your trust, and we turned against one another. Again and again, you called us to return. Through prophets and sages, you revealed your righteous law. And in the fullness of time, you sent your only son, born of a woman, to fulfill your law, to open for us the way of freedom and peace. And therefore, we praise you, joining with the heavenly chorus, with prophets, apostles, and martyrs, and with all those in every generation who have looked to you in hope to proclaim with them your glory in their unending hymn. So, Father, we who have been redeemed by him and made a new people by water and the Spirit, now bring before you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be the body and blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord. On the night he was betrayed, he took bread, said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his friends and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, gave thanks, and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering now his work of redemption and offering to you this sacrifice of thanksgiving, we celebrate his death and resurrection as we await the day of his Lord God of our fathers and mothers, God of Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebekah, Jacob, Leah and Rachel, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, open our eyes to see your hand at work in the world about us. Deliver us from the presumption of coming to this table for solace only and not for strength, for pardon only and not for renewal. Let the grace of this Holy Communion make us one body, one spirit in Christ, that we may worthily serve the world in his name. Risen Lord, be known to us in the breaking of the bread. Accept these prayers and praises, Father, through Jesus Christ, our great high priest, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit 
your church gives honor, glory, and worship from generation to generation. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Those of you who are not with us physically, you are indeed with us spiritually, and the promise is true. Would everyone please join in praying together the prayer for spiritual communion. Lord Jesus, as you promised to be with us in the bread and wine that is your body and blood, grant that we may receive you spiritually today into our hearts, minds, and souls. Stay with us, be our companion in the way, kindle our hearts and awaken hope that we may know you and have confidence in your loving care, now and forever. These are the gifts of God for you, the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on Christ in your hearts by faith and with thanksgiving. Thank mm-hmm. you.
let us go forth in the name of Christ.